Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato! Here it, here it, here it, here it comes. Our friends at Cobra Puma Golf have done it again with the new Aerojet family of drivers built to be the most aerodynamic they've ever made. Building on the impressive design and performance of the previous LTDX lineup, the advanced aerodynamic shaping of the Aerojet family is the product of years of research and testing with some of the fastest swings on the planet. The Aerojet drivers are available in three models aimed at catering to every player in the market. The Aerojet LS or low spin Rated the longest driver for 2023 by My Golf Spy is designed for skilled players that demand low launch and low spin for maximum workability and control. The standard Aerojet appeals to the wider spectrum of players and features aerodynamic shaping for faster club speed and an impressive combination of forgiveness and speed for maximum distance. And of course, the Aerojet Max, probably more along the lines of yourself and myself, Drewster, blends aero shaping with maximum stability and optional draw bias with a variety of adjustable weight ports offering an absurd amount of stability, control, and forgiveness for those of you who, just like us, struggle a little bit to get it off the tee box. All three models also feature the PowerShell face insert, which debuts for the first time in a Cobra driver, delivering a larger sweet zone for faster ball speed right across the face. So for more information on all three models of the Aerojet driver and to view the full family of Fairway Woods, visit www.cobragolf.com. This is the 19th T podcast, proudly presented by Cobra Puma Golf. Kieran Marsh, Nathan Drudy, back with you for another week, the back end of what is arguably the best week in Australian golf. Mr. Min Wu Lee, a winner for the fourth time worldwide, his third DP World Tour victory, his first major Australian victory. I said it late on Saturday in my review, it was going to be a coronation and it did feel like it on Sunday, and it has felt it in the time since that we do have a new, a burning new star in Australian golf. Certainly, and we have said it many times on this show previously that we've known about Min Woo Lee for a long time. We've known that he's a very, very good golfer, um, and we've just kind of been waiting for that breakthrough. It did happen in Europe, I, I suggest, maybe 18 months ago or two years ago now, um, uh, and for him to come home and win a big Aussie tournament. I think this is what we've been waiting for. It's what we said in our preview. And I think first and foremost, we should pat ourselves on the back because we finally delivered KM after months of agonizing poor picks. We are no longer the jinx. We have delivered a successful winner tip. We have. And in a week where we both tipped the same man, uh, Mm. which is rare in and of itself. So yeah, the stars are aligned for a successful week, not only for Midway Lee, but for this podcast as it relates to events. Mm. Uh, Drew, it's just an incredible performance, really. 20 under is the score at the end of 72 holes. Uh, three strokes is the margin over Rikuya Hoshino and a fast finishing Mark Leishman, who we'll get to, mm. I'm sure, with that Sunday mm. 64. But you mentioned that kind of breakthrough, that Scottish Open back in 2021. Uh, that was comfortably the most significant victory uh, of his three previous to date. I would suggest this eclipses it for a variety of reasons. Um, the field at the Scottish Open might have been stronger. I think the significance of this victory and the platform that it presents in terms of the stepping stones for his career now, um, not least of which uh, shoring up another invite to Augusta National. He jumps up mm-hmm. to 38 in the world, a career mm-hmm. high 38 in the world. Yes. Um, as I said, it's his first major victory here in Australia. We spoke about that expectation uh, in the preview last week of what he would be carrying into this weekend, he seemed to not just handle it, um, but embrace and thrive upon it. Uh, and I, I just think what this win represents for him, it's almost come at the perfect time in his upward trajectory in the sense of having the country more broadly now get behind him based on what they've seen in the last four days at Royal Queensland. Certainly. And you've, uh, you've, you've stolen my graphic KM. I was looking for a stat and I was wondering what I could do. And, and 38 was the number that I, I found obviously Min Woo Lee's highest um, ranking on the OWGRs for, as I always say, for whatever that is worth in your mind. Um, it, he's now number 38 on the rankings. And 
it feels like it's only kind of just the beginning. It's weird, Marshy. I don't, I don't know if you feel kind of the same because we, as I keep coming back to, we've known about Mimwili for so long. He's been such a competitive golfer in numerous tournaments, won some big ones as a Scottish, obviously, as you mentioned, but, but this kind of seems a little different now. It seems like he's ready to, to kickstart the career in 38. I mean, is, you know, so high in the rankings for, for a guy who really is, is, pretty much is very close to the beginning of his career realistically you know he's got so much left to give his game just sets up so beautifully and and, and as i always see uh, after a, after a win there were people starting to ask the question about is Moon Lee a major champion and i mean like, i think we just get ahead of ourselves sometimes i mean i don't want to take anything away from the aussie pga but you know we just sometimes it's, it's worth a little little reality check but you know, nonetheless, it, it was it was phenomenal, and I think his his bounce back after the early bogey was impressive. Just the way that he melts the ball off the tee is just going to hold him in such good stead. It's yeah, I, I I find it a little hard sometimes to probably try and keep this to the you know five to six minutes that we want to want to chat on Minwoo Lee because you could talk talk for a long time about him. I think we'll dig into the round specifically in a moment, but you make a really good point about the rapid rise really in the last 12 months. So that the, the anchor point being that Scottish Open victory, which was really the breakthrough moment as we've discussed back in 2021. But if you look back at the body work over the last 11 and a half months, it started with um, being in a tie for second, one stroke back of a win at the HSBC Abu Dhabi Championship back in January. Uh, it's included a top five at the US Open, T6 at the Players, He's won his last start before turning up here in Australia, going away from the field at 30 under in the Macau Open. He now comes here and wins arguably our biggest tournament. Uh, it probably still has the nod over the Australian Open just after the few years hiatus that the Aussie Open did have. It's certainly, as the opening event of the DP World Tour season, attracted one of the best fields we've seen in Australia probably in the last five or six years. And he did it with such, I won't say ease, but he looked comfortable because it wasn't easy at times. And as I said, we'll dive into the into the round at the moment, but he looked comfortable in the pressure situation, which I found so impressive. You know, like there were other names, Smith, the defending champion, Leishman, the journeyman, Scott, a master's champion. There were other names you wouldn't have been surprised. Even Lucas Herbert, the way he's been playing his golf the last 12 to 18 months. Mm be the one holding up the Joe Kirkwood Cup, but we we flagged everyone's expectation was that this, this kid would come home and perform like this based on the year he's had. And he just didn't miss a beat. Yeah. Uh, it was it was so impressive really and 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 I I, I say that with zero expectation. I want, I want to get out ahead of that. Twenty eleven was the last time someone did a double. And that was Rod Pampley. Yeah. Uh you know, the double of the PGA uh, sorry, not Rod Pampley, I think it might have been Greg Chalmers. It's one of the two. Back in 2011 was the last time the double of the PGA in the Open was repeated. So if he goes down there and ends up in T15 at the Australian Golf Club come Sunday, that's perfectly fine because he's done everything we could have asked in terms of coming home, waving the flag, performing for Australian golf back here in Australia. Yeah, I agree. And um, I'll get out in front and say I don't, I don't think he will win this week um, uh, I, to all the all the reasons that you said. Um, just there. I mean, we got a message today. Do you think that he can that he can do the double? And um, I don't. Yeah, I, I just don't think he can. Um, it's it's such an energy draining week. He'll certainly be up for it, no doubt. Uh, but we'll get to that a little later. Uh, I, to your point that you raised on Saturday, it was it, it was a coronation, and and that's that's purely what it was. And and I think watching on Sunday, even though the margin, I mean, they were level there at one point early on in the round, it just felt that that Minwoo Lee was going to run away with it. And and I know that maybe three shots isn't running away with it, but in the grand scheme of things, it, it was it was kind of like a uh like a, a beautiful shepherd in the AFL marshy. Just you know, the spread arms, just blocking, sort of giving your mate a couple of meters. That's exactly what Minwoo Lee did. He never allowed any space for anyone to come in after three or four holes and 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 that was um that was all she wrote and you know, allowed him to have a bit of fun on the party hole and and all of that sort of stuff. So it was great. It was a, a great win, and um, you know, thoroughly deserved for a guy who's who's only on the up from here. Just confirming it was in fact Greg Chalmers 
Um, so I'm glad I corrected myself halfway through there. Greg Chalmers was the last person to take the Australian PJ Australian Open double uh, way back in 2011. It was a good point, Drew. I felt pretty comfortable from the fourth hole onwards when he kind mm. of stuffed that tee shot to two foot on the par three fourth. Um, he'd had a couple of stumbles, obviously the, um, was it two or three stroke lead that he held after 54 holes? I think it was three strokes was gone after two holes mm. um, with Hoshino going birdie, birdie to start. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I just felt like he took a moment, uh, a deep breath on the fourth tee mm. box and, you know, um, after Joaquin Neiman had aced that hole, uh, only two or three groups ahead of him, and we almost had, you know, hole in ones in the same hole within half an hour. So <laughs> I felt from there it was pretty comfortable. Not to say there weren't stumbles. Yeah. Um, but I felt like every time he stumbled, he made up for it. You know, you have the bogey on 10, and then he goes to the 11th, um, which wasn't the most difficult part three of the week, but certainly wasn't easy. And he leaves it short in the bunker. And gets up and down to two feet. I was standing mm. behind the green at that time. A, a ridiculous shot. I couldn't. I could see the top of his white cap mm. from the bunker. Mm. Uh, and, and to get it up and down to two feet at eleven, he did it again. You know, he, he goes long left on fourteen. Uh, absolutely smashes his putter. <laughs> Doesn't put yeah. himself in a great position. Goes bogey there, but birdie on the fifteenth. So yeah. every time there was a slight stumble, and um, you know, even the bogey on the eighteenth to finish. It should have been really a four-stroke victory. That part is an inch away from dropping. So I never felt uncomfortable after the fourth hole. And I think, to be fair, I felt he deserved that after the way he played for three and a bit rounds. I felt like he deserved to enjoy the moment. And he certainly did that, to your point. You you saw the way in which he embraced the 17th hole. Um, You saw the way that the scenes played out coming up and then ultimately on the 18th green after the 72nd hole. I'm glad it didn't get nervous because this was an important victory for him and he deserved the opportunity to embrace every part of that mm. and, and enjoy it for what it was. Yeah, agreed. I think, you know, your point there, I think he showed a lot of maturity that maybe we haven't seen from him in, in years gone by. And that's maybe just literally a coming of age, literally growing up. Um, I, the, the, the tournament for me, the last thing that I'll say on, on Minwoo Lee, the tournament for me was done on the ninth when he pitched in from 50 whatever it was i think it was smack on 50 and it was uh, you know that put f- i think it was five shots um at that point I, i'm not sure if um I, yes it was five shots i'm not sure if Hashi- uh, hashino went to ma- went on to make birdie there um and bring it back to four shots but the, the tournament was done pretty much there and then and um yeah it, it was yeah it was a mere I'll steal your word again, a mere coronation going into the back nine and uh, yeah, put the crowd into a frenzy. It was great. And uh, yeah, I loved it. So props to Minwoo Lee. That was gotta... wild. I, mm. yeah, I, I was actually, um, I spent a lot of the day before picking him up mm-hmm. kind of floating around the area that is um, the back of the 11th uh, green, which flows on to the 12th tee box. And then to your left, you get, 13 green and then you walk up the path between um 14 and 15 fairways that's a great little spot in the middle of rq there where you, you if you kind of park yourself you were getting a lot of groups coming through you're picking up a number of different holes and i was walking i think i was trying to um, get up to see laurie flynn and his group on the 14th fairway when i heard that roar and i almost text you mm. to say has someone hit hole in one because that's that was what it sounded like from right in in between the 14th and 15th hole and as i was getting my phone out uh, to send you that message we, we got a, a dm on instagram from great friend of the show brad mcintosh um so fair chipping on nine there from min uh, and I, I couldn't believe it like literally the noise was what you'd equate to someone acing the 17th mm. that's the that's the level of feedback we were getting from six holes away on the other side of the property. So yep. that was a really special moment. And to be honest, in terms of our flagship tournaments, that's as as good a singular moment as I can remember mm. um, in recent memory. I, I don't think we've had, an, and there's probably a variety of different reasons for that. He is an Australian player. It is our flagship tournament. It came at a time where it was really to seal and, and put it beyond doubt. And to step up, he put himself in a shit spot off the tee. He admitted that. And to step up and hit that shot, execute it, and then to watch him react the way that he did, it was awesome. It was an awesome singular moment. So, look, not much else to say. Um, 
one other piece I thought was significant that he himself brought up, which we'll lose sight of a little bit um, going through this summer and then probably into the early parts of next year when we get into the majors, but it is coming up and that's the Olympics. And he called it out in the press conference post around about how much it would mean to him to go and represent Australia at the Olympics. Mm. I'm sure in the back of his mind, because it's, I think it's almost beyond a shadow of a doubt that his sister will be one of the two women. Mm-hmm. Um, you would think it's probably going to be Minji and Hannah Green. Uh, there may be a, a Grace Kim type who jumps into that second spot, but Minji is all but locked. I think it would mean a great deal for him to represent his country alongside his sister as well. Yeah. So that OWGR, and I agree with you, what, whatever currency you put in the OWGR, it is still significant from the perspective of Olympic selection because he now jumps ahead of Cam Davis, who's dropped into the mid-40s after this week, mm-hmm. and sits only behind Cam Smith and Jason Day. Uh, now, whether or not Jason Day decides to, if he does end up in that second position, still go, um, that's probably a question in and of itself. But I think Jason Day is now 21st in the world, um, min with 38th, and coming home with a wet sail. That that won't be finalised until later into next year. You'll have plenty of opportunities, particularly through the majors, to um, you know earn further OWGR points. But just keep that in the back of your mind moving forward. It's the top two. Uh, ranked males and females that will go. And it was something that he himself offered as being significant. So it's definitely in the back of his mind. Who do you want to talk about next? Where do you where do you want to go? Because there's a couple of players maybe in the top 10 that we can kind of skim over. Uh, but who yeah, look, is there anyone that you want to spend a minute or two on? Yeah, with the greatest respect to Rakuya Hoshino, um, and he played incredibly well. I had a funny moment uh, talking to good friend Ewan Porter. Uh, mm. Port Ports there briefly as he was coming back up the 13th uh, fairway and he stopped for a brief chat and um, <laughs> he said he was uh, diving deep into the recesses of his memory to try and come up with some common ground um, through the first couple of holes and it looked like a Shino might be in for a show because uh, Rakuya doesn't speak a lick of English and Ports only got 1 through 10 in Japanese and the word thank you. So he was <laughs> saying he was considering his options for what the post round was going to look like. With the greatest respect for Akuya Hoshino, um, credit to him, wonderful tournament. I don't want to spend much more time than that on him. I want to go to Mark Leishman mm-hmm. because that's probably as good a golf as I've seen Leish play in two years, I reckon, mm. specifically Sunday, but the body of work to put himself in that position where a Sunday 64 gets him within four shots of victory. I thought, he was excellent. And then upon further thought, it shouldn't come as much surprise because that course specifically, and I say this with no disrespect to Leash, I don't necessarily expect him to go and repeat that performance mm. across the lakes and the Australian. It should come as no surprise that Royal Queensland suited his game well because mm. it, it is as it is as links adjacent as you'll get in Queensland mm. as anything else. And I think he rose to the occasion. He did, yeah. And play the the a fleeting moment there that you thought maybe he could challenge for the lead in the end didn't. Uh, but a Sunday 64, I mean, he's going to put you in contention 9.9 times out of 10. Right. Um, and you know, maybe, um, maybe because we haven't paid as close attention to live golf, maybe we've been off the dial a little bit, given that we focused on the Australian stuff a lot more. I mean, he's, he's been playing some solid, golf I think in in totality and and is a guy who I think would desperately love to continue coming back to Australia and being successful now that is and with with the greatest respect to Leash that is getting more difficult for him now that we have guys like Minwoo Lee like the bloke we're going to talk about next in in Curtis Luck um we've got these guys coming through who are going to be the next superstars cam smith of course um and then of course you've got guys like adam scott who just bob up as well so i i think it's it obviously gets a lot more tough for mark leishman to come back and be competitive but that i think now is going to be where his game continues to be at i think he's he's probably out of the major window now but he can come back to australia and win an Aussie PGA or an Aussie Open, and I think that would feel nearly as good as a major to him. That's probably my two cents on leash. And to agree, and I think he'd be as thrilled as anybody uh, with the news that 
the PGA will return to Royal Queensland next November. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's going back again for a fourth consecutive year. Um, I, would, I would anticipate, you know, barring any um, injury in the next 12 months, he would be competitive again because, as I said, I think his game is perfectly suited to that style of course. And, yeah, I tend to agree with, with more flexibility around his schedule, um, more time to spend at home around the tournaments. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him, you know, be competitive in these two tournaments moving forward over the next couple of years. I think he's at a point uh, where he's got a fair bit of perspective about where he's at in his career. He's had a wonderful run. Um, you know, he's earning significant amounts of money now playing uh, live golf, and, and that's also allowing him to spend more time at home over the summer, which uh, means lots of guys like himself and Cam Smith. So I was really chuffed. And you could see it in his face as well. You know, there was a smile on his face um, all through Sunday that I don't know. And I don't, this is not meant to be disrespectful. I don't know that we've seen it mm. for a long time. Like I probably haven't seen him seemingly enjoy his golf like that, maybe since the President's Cup back in 2019 around Royal Melbourne. Mm. You know, he just, he was thriving uh, in that environment and in, in that place where he was in real contention there for a period of time. So yeah, it was awesome. I, I, it was probably one of the nicer things uh, and fond memories looking back on that weekend is to see him relevant again. For me, the second best thing behind Mimu Lee was Curtis Luck. Um, yeah. I, it was obviously uh, great to see Mark Leishman, <clears throat> Leishman bob up, Adam Scott, similarly, um, you know, there were some other really cool storylines which we can chat about. But yeah, Curtis Luck again is a guy who feels like has been around the traps for a long time, has has done a fair stint over in the US, kind of comes back and gets forgotten about in, in a lot of ways. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but when guys like Cam Smith and Leash and Minwoo Lee now, thanks to his TikTok presence and all the rest of it, when those guys come back, they take the limelight, right? Um, and Curtis Luck, I feel like he's quite comfortable with that and he he just goes about his business and 66, 67, 66, 69 is, is really good, competitive, solid golf. Two over on the front nine in the final round, I think, really kind of took the wind out of his sails. You know, if they're pars, all of a sudden he's in a tie for second. Um, and and one of them was a really sloppy par, uh, so sloppy bogey, my apologies, on the, uh, on the seventh, which was a par five. Um, and yeah, just that kind of took the wind out of his sails. I know he made four birdies on the back, came in with a 31, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, pleasing to see Curtis Luck deliver the performance that he did. Completely agree. I think I said it, uh, Saturday afternoon and I felt that he was, if anyone was going to be a threat to me it would be him based on what I'd seen for the first three days. And to your point, I mean, he comes back home in 31, no one in the field had a better second nine than he did on Sunday. A couple had the same back nine. Uh, Leash was one of them, but no one better. And you look at those two bogeys, I mean, to your point, you, you, you're dropping a shot, not even powering a par five. And then the second hole, it's probably one of the easiest short fours out in the course. Mm-hmm. So even if you know one of them's a par, one of them's a birdie, it's, it's game on, really, in terms of the way he came home. So... Uh, I thought he was excellent. You know, this is a guy who he's not as relevant because he doesn't have the status in the States. Yeah. And I'm not talking about like um, profile or popularity. I'm talking about literal status in terms of playing status. Uh, he's a guy who's established himself over there. He won an American amateur, but this is a guy who grew up with Minwoo. Yeah. Like, you know, he <laughs> they were running around courses in Perth through their team. He's playing together. They're great mates. And Curtis has taken a different path in establishing himself in the US, but he's a wildly talented player. I absolutely mm. loved those burnt orange pants on Saturday. Massive <laughs> Rick, fan of those. Very Ricky, weren't yeah. they? It was, and that, that's maybe one of the better um, fashion items I saw across the entire four days. But no, I agree. I think, um, and I, I think it's a game that's sustainable moving into this week as well. So I'm very curious to see if he can back that up. Not to suggest he goes better, but can he, can he give himself another top 10? Um, and what, if any, effect does that have on the rest of his time here? Is he straight back to the US or because he's picking up a few order of merit points, does he maybe play a few other tournaments and get a bit of European tour status? Who knows? I mean, mm-hmm. he, he's he's fortunate that he does have a few options. Yeah. Um, and he has a very well-established, um, you know, set up in, in the US. But 
yeah, I, I just think it's one of those things where, to your point, um, he's not a forgotten man of Australian golf, just not as mm. um, beloved as a few others based purely on not being in front of our eyes as often. Uh, and it's nice to get the reminder of just how bloody good a player a former American amateur champion is. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasant, pleasant surprise. Who else is on your list here? Because I probably don't need to wax lyrical about Joaquin Neiman. I mean, I mean, we should mention as well, Curtis Luck made an ace, so did Joaquin Neiman. There were a couple of hole-in-ones going mm-hmm. around. I mean, probably Scotty's maybe the next one for me, but is there any anyone else really in the top 10 that you kind of want to give a couple of minutes to? Uh, probably not outside. I mean, there's a the couple below um, Scotty, so we might go to Scotty next because my only other two in the top 10 are okay. go for it. just brief ones on Cam Davis and Lucas Herbert. Look, Scotty was... I mean, I'm looking here, two bogeys in that final round. Um, also bogey 10, which is surprising. It's not a difficult hole. Uh, yeah. I find that really hard to believe that, um, you know, <laughs> three players who are really in contention for the tournament and Lee, uh, Shino and Scott all bogey 10 on the final day. That was weird. Um, <laughs> and then he's, he's, he's bogey the fourth because um, he pushed his tee shot left there as well, which is, I wouldn't say unforgivable, but certainly not what you expect a player of his quality um, on that path three as well. So look, I think outside of those two mistakes, he looked really good. Um, watched him again come through 11. He went to the bunker on the left-hand side and played an absurd shot uh, out of that bunker on the 11. Like, I think that's one of the things that you do get when you go to these tournaments is not that you are unaware, but a greater appreciation for the fact that these guys are playing a different game. Mm. Like some of the touch, and maybe that's probably one thing I didn't necessarily articulate too well with Minwoo Lee. He obviously has elite speed uh, and elite distance, and he was melting the ball, no doubt, around Royal Queensland, but his touch was phenomenal. Um, and Scotty's a great proponent of that as well. So I think he he is in a really good place with his game. We, t- we spoke about it coming in. Let's see, he had five top tens worldwide this year. Um, so like the game's in a good place, but you just could tell, I think, a little bit of the media that he did, a little bit of stuff in broadcast, watching him walk around on Sunday, really embraced his role in the game from an Australian perspective, maybe more so than most and Min Wu now has a role and I think he's sitting comfortably in that role but you know that statesman role sits really well with him um believe he's just taken Rory's spot uh on the um pack as the pack advisory board member for the Mm -hmm. PGA Tour after Rory originally stepped down so that that kind of balance and the juggle of I'm still a serious player like a fucking serious player Mm. but I'm aware of the progression of my career from this point forward. And I have a very keen appetite to give back and that's clear. So it was awesome to watch him um, in that group on Sunday with Lucas Herbert, spending a lot of time standing next to Herbie, talking to Herbie and, you know, Herbie's no slouch, but you can only imagine what that means to a guy like Lucas Herbert to walk Mm. around in the final round of an Australian PGA for 18 holes with one of his fighters. So yeah, I, I was really impressed with not only the way he played golf, but the way he approached the tournament more broadly over the four days. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, serves a, serves an important purpose for for Australia golf and the Aussie PGA the, or the PGA of Australia. You know, coming back and really kind of headlining a lot of the uh, a lot of a lot of the media with Cam Smith, etc. So the only other two in the top ten that I kind of just wanted to mention, <laughs> Joel Moscatel, shot out to one of the great the one of the great yeah. starts that you'll see. Um, and then truly faded out of the tournament and, and finished T seven. I mean, for the rest of for the rest of the tournament, he shot three under par, um, but finds himself uh, in a tie for seventh. And then the other one was Frank Kennedy as well, which I think was a great story. Um, other than to say, uh, he's only a teenager uh, and turned pro this year and comes down to Australia. He's a um, he, he's a pom. He comes down T seven. Um, 71, 66, 69, 67 on Sunday. Hold a massive uh, putt, I think, on 18 as well. Um, so, yeah, just a couple of great great little stories there. That, that That's all I wanted to uh, call out out of the top 10. Um, just briefly on Luke Serbent and Cam Davis, I think 
Uh, anytime you finish T7 in a tournament and are disappointed with your week, ironically, I think is a really good place to be. And just watching those two guys get around um, and then re-watching a bit of the broadcast last night after I got home, you could tell there was frustration from both those guys that they expect better of themselves. Um, I think Herbie's putter in particular struggled a fair bit uh, around Royal Queensland. So I would yeah. expect both to to play a significant role in the tournament coming up this weekend because I think there'll be a burning desire to make amends for what they probably feel as a missed opportunity in Brisbane. Agreed. Yeah, I was just all I had to add there was Herbie made. I just did some quick stats as you were talking before. Herbie made nine bogeys this week, which was the most of any player in the top ten. Uh, Cam Davis conversely made two, um, and I'll get right out ahead of it. And he's my pick for the Aussie Open. Um, I think if okay. you can make if you can make two bogeys um, in fifty four holes, uh, sorry, in seventy two holes of golf, both of them came in the first round. If you don't mind as well, went bogey free for over sixty holes. Um, I'll lock him in for for my pick for the Aussie Open. So that was a nice nice segue there into that. But let's keep let's keep going on the on the leaderboard. Unless you've got who else have you got? There's probably a handful of names that I can shout out quickly. But you go. Okay, I just want to run through a few people that I saw mm-hmm. on Sunday. Um, so I spent a couple of holes walking with Mika. Uh, Mika finishes eventually in a tie for 18. Uh, and I read. Today, I read a good little piece that uh, Jimmy Emanuel wrote about Mika and his new caddy, uh, Ben Brewer, mm-hmm. Benji Brewer, who also happens to be the husband of our great friend, Whipper, Whitney Hillier. Yes. Yes. So it was a nice little piece that Jimmy's done. If you haven't caught up with that one, PJ uh, website, a uh, good little piece on Mika. And Mika spoke about being as disappointed after that golf tournament as he's ever been having played. And I think it just speaks volumes about how his expectations have changed from 12 months ago. Uh, to now you know this was his opening tournament with full status on the dp world tour at home uh coming off the back of a win at mooner um he hasn't disgraced himself sure he's finished 12 shots back but he's in a tough right eighth and he was filthy so i think that's again that's a really good place for someone like mika to be because we aren't the david mika world tour 12 months ago scratching for starts in tournaments we're a bona fide dp world tour player now who won the Order of Merit last year, and we should be expecting more of ourselves. So yep. I was fortunate to see him drain a very long putt uh, on the 15th green, I believe. Um, he did share that video and say it was the longest putt he made all week. So <laughs> that's probably an indication of where the uh, the flat stick was yep. to Mika across the week, but it was good to um, good to see him. Jeffrey Guan also finished in a tie for 18th. That's, I think, um, comfortably his best performance since turning pro. He may have finished higher and has in tournaments, but when you consider the strength of the field and the test of that golf course, I think that's an awesome performance from Jeffrey Guan um, so early on in his pro career in one of the two major Australian tournaments. So shout out to him. Um, just below him, a shot back, Jack Thompson. It absolutely melts the ball. He was playing uh, on Sunday with Wazza, who we'll get to in a moment. That was Wazza, Jack Thompson, and Elvis Smiley in that group. Mm. and uh, watched them off the 15th tee. And I think he literally got his front heel off the ground, Jack Thompson, in his drive. It was incredible. Um, another one I want to share just briefly, Drew, is Matt Van Cliff is putting together a really good summer so far. Uh, mm-hmm. And he shot himself up to a tie for 15th with a 68 on Sunday. Um, all rounds under par, uh, considerably good week for Matt Van Cliff. And as I said, I think he's putting together quite the summer to date so i'm really interested to see how he goes this week uh down there in sydney uh and then just briefly um our man the whiz <laughs> he had the hot and cold showers running droots I, mm-hmm. I text you as i was walking in and i was saying i don't know if you're seeing whizzes around so far but he's off to a flyer so that's where i'm going first i'm gonna go out there and, and then i'll track back and pick up the leaders and by the time i got out to him um, I think he had at least one double and maybe another bogey. Uh, I had about a 50 second chat with him on the walk from 14 green to 15 T and it was just typically honest and, and, and ratified and, and, and I suppose re-exemplified to me all the reasons why we absolutely adore the man um, because yes. he was as filthy on himself as he's ever been. Uh, and then as he was walking up the man to the 15 T he turned to me, he goes, Oh, well, four more shots at birdie on your margin. And just got up on the team and walked off. So- it was good to see the whiz. He ends up in a tie for 40th 
um, at four under, but he grinded hard to make the weekend and then um, played some all right golf. And he goes home. The Aussie is his home course. So yeah. um, I say this out of pure bias, but if he can get to the weekend, because obviously you play around um, at the lakes and around at the Aussie Thursday, Friday. Um, and then if he can get through to the weekend, I'd expect him to, I'm just not, I don't think he's going to win the tournament, but I'd expect him to be in the top 20 at his home course if he can get two rounds at it on Saturday and Sunday. So always good to see our man, the Wiz. That's probably it. Um, Baz, sorry, one more Baz. Baz looked good. It, disappointing tournament for Baz. Um, mm. To be honest, he grinded his ass off just to make the weekend. Uh, he's 73 out the door, didn't put him in a good position. Um, and he just snuck into the weekend, but he looked good. I saw him um, play 16 and then he absolutely stuffed one on uh, on 17 on Sunday when uh, neither neither of his playing partners, Big Shot Bob and, and our mate Aaron Wilkin, um, weren't nearly as close. So it was a good shot to see him uh, step up for the play there at the party hole. That's major, it's, I think, for the leaderboard. couple quickly from me. Uh, no, we've got to get to the Aussie Open this week. I'm adding a new player to my official watch list to join Adri R now. Um, that is uh, the Icelandic golfer, uh, Haralda Magnus, uh, who finished T33. So he's officially joined my stable. Uh, a T33 finish for him, 70, 72, 70, 67. So welcome. Uh, I'll send him his, uh, his pin and badge uh, as is required. <laughs> Um, a couple of others that I just very, very quickly wanted to, to, uh, <clears throat> to mention that missed the cut. Um, I know that we are, yeah, I'm glad. We're, yeah. we're, we're generally pretty kind to players on here, but a disappointing week for Jake McLeod after some form a couple of weeks back, Jed Morgan, um, missed the cut at one over par, uh, Kazuma Kabori couldn't back it up. Louis Dobbola, Anthony Quayle, um, Eddie Pepperell, uh, all these guys missing uh, the cut, unfortunately, Kerry Mountcastle. So the winners this year actually not not going in here and, and performing. Nicholas Colserts, who missed the cut and then joined the commentary. Um, you sent me a message on Saturday going, who's this French bloke on the, on, on the commentary? It was Nicholas Colserts, who is in fact Belgian. Uh, he was fantastic on the commentary. I did I did think French adjacent. Uh, Blake Windred missed the cut. John, uh, Josh Greer, who's played some, some good golf. Johnny Vegas. Uh, Miss the cut, Harrison Crow. You'll notice that I haven't said uh, quite a popular name uh, just as yet. Jared Felton, who was one of your uh, hot hands going into the season. Dimi Papadatos at 10 under. But the mm. biggest name to miss the cut, Marshy, was that of Cameron Smith. And um, I don't think actually enough has really been made of, of this. And I don't want to pour shit on the guy because I do really like him. But... I think we've kind of glossed over it in the fact that Minwoo Lee won the tournament and, and that should absolutely be the talking point, but really, really, really disappointing show from Cameron Smith in, in uh, at a course that he obviously plays well at because he's a defending champion and a course that probably set up really well for him again, in terms of conditions, a really good uh, putter and a, and a good flyer of the ball. It wasn't one that certainly length was favored. Obviously Minwoo Lee went out and won, but didn't have to be a massive melter of the ball. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to round out on the Aussie PGA before I'll, maybe I'll, I'll chuck a couple of Dorothy Dixons to you about being on the ground. But, uh, yeah, just if you've got any quick takeaways on Cameron Smith. Oh, shock more than anything, if I'm honest, Drew. Um, it, it wasn't as if it was close. That, that round on Friday was as if it could be any more opposite to what I said about Leash in terms of the best golf I've seen Leash play in two years, that's that's the worst golf I've seen Cameron Smith play in a long time. It's hard to marry that player that we saw on the course on Friday with the guy that won the 150th Open Championship mm -hmm. at the old course, the St. Andrews. Everything that he usually has at his disposal, his approach play, his short game around the green and then his putter were absent. And, you know, after the round, he described it as shit. He said it was the worst performance of his professional career. And at one point it was holding him back to years. Mm. So I wonder, and I hope there's nothing else going on, but it was so out of character. And to his credit, 
Um, he he rocked up on Saturday. He rocked up on Sunday. He spent time at the junior clinics. He spent time at the autograph tables. And when mm. he wasn't there, he was either on the practice screen or at the range. So he was be as disappointed. No one has to remind him of how bad that performance was because no one will be more acutely aware of it than himself. Yeah. But um, I, 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 I think he's got a lot of questions to answer mm. this week at the Australian Open. Not literally, but like just with his game and mm. how he turns up after that. Because if he turns up and has a top 10, top five, that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest, that it's an aberration. But if there's something else going on and we're in a bit of a, the beginning of a form glut, which I truly hope we aren't. But yeah, I just, that's the last I saw of him was Friday and I'm going to struggle to, to come to a sensical answer about what is going on until I can see him again on Thursday and how he hits the ball. Cause it just, it didn't look like Cameron Smith to me. And I'm, for that reason, I do hope it's a one-off aberration. Um, and it's, it's weird. Like I said to you in the previous show, I said, I felt like his focus would be the Aussie because he's won the PJ. He's never won an Aussie. It's the missing piece. But I said, by the same token, he can't help but contend at Royal Queensland because he knows that course like the back of his hand. I didn't mm. expect to be talking about him missing a cut at nine over. No. Um, yeah, a truly weird performance and one that I hope is uh, left at the gates of Royal Queensland. Very quickly from me, just looking from the outside in and then I'll let you talk about what you saw on the ground. Um, I thought, uh, I, I know obviously we spoke in the lead up about um, some of the comments uh, likening the the party hole to that of what we see at Waste Management and, and probably what we saw at Live, Go- Live Golf a little. Um, I, I didn't, I, in the moment I didn't mention it, but it was funny that they never mentioned, that they didn't mention obviously what they, what they delivered at Live Golf. Um, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't say that I didn't enjoy it, but like it was, it was phenomenal what they delivered over the, over four days. I've really, really enjoyed it. And you know what, if, if I had the money, I'd definitely go there. And I think they've done a great job. Really, really good thing that they've added. Um, I know we didn't get the scenes of the, you know, the, the, the cans of beer being thrown on the, on the green and stuff. And in a, in a way that's actually kind of nice. Um, obviously we didn't see many, aces, any aces there on the Sunday. Um, but uh, the, the atmosphere was amazing. The Viking clap that Minwoo Lee kind of got everyone into, everyone throwing the golf balls out. It, w- it was wicked. Absolutely loved it. 10 out of 10 execution. I reckon that thing's only going to grow and grow and grow as that um, as that kind of um, tournament continues to go back to, um, to RQ there. So pumped. Love it. I think it was um, well executed and, and really, really pleased that we can deliver something like that. Um, I think live golf was much the same. It was wicked to see it. Obviously, probably maybe a little more focus on the booze at live golf than <laughs> what was that um, at the Aussie. But um, yeah, I, I still think we've got a, a fair stretch to go before we get the waste management because waste management is packed to the rafters from Tuesday, uh, not just on Saturday and Sunday. But massive props to to them for delivering that. So what did you see on the, on, on the grounds, Marshy? And, you, and you, you know, you're out there for a few hours on Sunday. What did you see? And, um, and then maybe we can turn our attention quickly to the Aussie. Just on the 17th, I, I completely agree with you. I think the evolution of that whole um, in the time the tournament's been, it's the third iteration now at Royal Queensland from where it started, which was just those grandstands at the back, those three grandstands yeah. behind the green. Uh, was the first year um, to now where you've got players literally walking through a tunnel and it's completely surrounded. It, it makes an enormous difference. Yep. Um, only 125 meter par three droods. It pay it played over par all four days. Yeah. So yep. it, it's also become a genuine challenge, not least of which just because of the design. It's a it's a terribly daunting hole when none of that infrastructure is there. But when you put four thousand people around it and constant music playing and the ability to try and level out your adrenaline. If you're coming off a birdie on the 16th and you're making a bit of a run home and you've got people Viking clapping and singing along to you're the voice. Yeah. And it was great. Just the ability to try and it, it's an excellent atmosphere. Like I'm, I'm full credit to it, but I think it's a wonderful challenge as well because the temptation is to go out there and overheat your shot because you can't actually level out your own adrenaline. So yeah. I think where it's placed in the round at 17 is almost perfect as well. Like that, that probably 
could work on one or two of the other, like conceivably that could work on the 11th given the space and that par three, it definitely could. But I think where they placed it as the second last hole in your round is perfect yeah. because it has the ability to undo some rounds in a really important part of the tournament. So yeah, credit to them. Um, just more broadly, super impressed with the way in which Royal Queensland absorbs that tournament. And it's gotten, I think, I think the 17th is a microcosm more broadly how it's grown over the three years of hosting the tournament. I'm thrilled for them that they get a fourth year because every year it's been better. And you just see the way that, like, I haven't been to a lot of major tournaments around the world. I'm not suggesting the Australian PGA compares to, you know, an elevator on the PGA Tour or a major. But in terms of our calendar here, it is one of the biggest events. Mm. And there's so much infrastructure at that golf course that goes into hosting the Australian PGA. And the way in which it absorbs that, it has no interruption to the flow of the course, but also plenty of amenities and little breakout villages for, you know, food and bed, for big screens, for activities for the kids. I just, it was awesome. The setup there is outstanding. Um, comfortably the best crowds I've seen in the three years that I've been going to the tournament at Royal Queensland, and that's grown as well. And I think that's a combination of having a great offering on the 17th, having affordable pricing, and any kid under the age of 17 getting in for free, which is wonderful in terms mm-hmm. of growing the game. So credit to the, um, the tour for that as well. Uh, and I just think that the feeling and the atmosphere out there on Sunday, and sure it helps that an Australian was in the box seat to win the tournament, but it was... It was awesome. It was awesome to go around around with people that have a genuine love for the game. It's awesome to see, you know, you see the announcement today that the better part of one in five people in Australia are involved in golf. I think 17.6% of adults is now the new figure um, participation-wise released by Golf Australia today. That's translating and it's this popularity we've spoken about off the back of COVID. The game's been taken up and now delivering tournaments at quality courses with quality fields to a captive audience. Uh, It's that really start growth you can feel it it's tangible it's not just people playing on a public course it's people paying their hard-earned cash in the middle of a cost of living crisis to go and see fucking good golf and yeah that was awesome you know it was great to get out there really enjoyed it great to catch up with um fellow podcaster mike caridi the three part par podcast I had a good couple of holes walking around with mike and uh you know i think i came out of that photo looking probably the best which i don't often do and i'm sure mike white <laughs> might be saying that so Lovely fellow, Mike. Uh, he made the trip up from Melbourne to come and see the tournament over Saturday and Sunday, and he's got the best tips uh, of any golf podcast going out there. So he's a bit more punting focused for those who haven't listened to the Three Part Par podcast, but if you're interested in betting, you'll get a bit more tailored advice sure. um, for investing your cash there. So I give Mike a shout out there. It's great to catch up with him. Great to catch up with Ports and, as I said, a couple of other players there that we've built a good relationship with. So thoroughly enjoyed the time out there on Sunday. And as I said, Thrilled that it's coming back to Royal Queensland next November. Great job on the socials as well, Kayan. Um, I do think at some point we can have a broader discussion about the, we can revisit our evolution talk about where the Aussie Open and the Aussie PGA lives and whether it should move around the country a little more. Cause obviously yep. this will be four years in a row at the, uh, at RQ, which I think it was 10 previously at Royal Pines. In the, before absolutely. That, so. so it's, so it's, it's definitely got a lock in that Queensland space. There's a lot of determining factors that sit behind that state government, probably federal government, etc. Anyway, let's push on uh, to the Aussie open uh, at the Australian and the lakes uh, commencing on Thursday um, running through to Sunday men and women combined, which is another exciting component as is the all abilities Alongside the yes yes the, the all mean. abilities and uh, the defending champ is adrian moronk uh the polishman um there's a, a this is probably the stronger of the two fields i would probably say uh that has been um assembled um i think this may be a, a probably another discussion that we can have at a different time that um people uh such as jason norris who won the uh what did he win a couple of weeks back? The Australian Senior PGA Championship. Yes, no uh, the seniors, yeah. Yeah, not not getting a start in this event um, for uh, guys like Michael Block, uh, who I know have uh, probably been the whipping boy here. Mav Ancliffe also not getting a start. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that another time. Uh, who's doing the weather, you or me? I've got it up. You, please. Excellent. Yeah, that'll be good. Looking fucking shit else, which is typical Sydney yeah. in summer. 
uh, Wednesday. And with an event, and with an event yeah. on, because yeah. you couldn't get a full five days play at the SCG test. Oh. Which are, Christ. Uh, the, long story short, that test needs to be moved. Thank Christ they're going to play two in Melbourne. Um, rain, uh, possible storm on Wednesday leading in. Um, Marshy just, so this is important, 35 mil of rain expected. So that is going to just... Uh, make it really difficult to get this course in condition to actually be able to be playable on Thursday. It does dry out. Slight chance of a shower only, one mil of rain expected that day, max of 28. So it'll be nice and humid for the players across Thursday, particularly Friday, same again. And then we come into the weekend, Saturday, uh, zero to four mils of rain expected, 15 to 20 kilometer winds. And then Sunday, probably the most challenging um, of the four days of play, 20 to 30 kilometer winds and five mil of rain expected. So not looking particularly great. Uh, Certainly not going to have the sunny skies that we saw up in Queensland, but uh, yeah, a challenge for the groundskeepers. Uh, at the Australian and the Lakes Marshy. Any initial thoughts before you deliver your tip? Because I have given mine already in, in Cameron Davis. So uh yeah. Who any just any thoughts briefly, before you get there? Just briefly, Druids, uh, Ashley Buhai, the defending Australian women's open champion, Kip Hoppet, the defending champion in the all abilities as well. So I know that was a um a great event globally uh, there were some frustrations from the players on all three sides about how it was managed in the course um, i'll be interested to see how they've adjusted that but i know it's a flagship event from global viewers who love seeing all three and uh, going at the same time so look yeah. um from the men's side i think weather's going to play a big part to your point i think it will be your ability to kind of make it through like it is interesting and uh, we see it very occasionally on the pga tour uh, and also on the DP World Tour, particularly in Scotland, where you have these tournaments, which juggles two courses. So, you know, getting the lakes is going to be better than the Aussie on one day and, and vice versa, given the weather report mm. you've just given us. And so it's going to be pure luck of the draw about where you're playing when. And then, of course, the the Australian Golf Club for two days on the weekend. So I agree. I think it's a slightly stronger field. Um, the women's field is exceptional, not just all of our homegrown talent, whether it's um, Minji Lee, Hannah Green, Grace Kim, Steph Kiriakou, Kirsten Rudgley coming home off a T4 finish in the Ladies European Tour event over the weekend. Um, you've got quality overseas players, not least of which Buhai, the defending champion, Suyon Ru, the Korean. Um, like this is a quality field across mm. all three. Uh, and I think it's just going to be a wonderful weekend of golf. So all of that is to say, I think um, for the reasons I said earlier about his feelings post his fourth round and and overall from Royal Queensland. And also the last time I saw him play in similar conditions to this, which was the final round of the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship, where he rocketed up the leaderboard. I'm going to say David Michaluzzi will take home his first Australian Open. Um, I don't, I don't, yeah, so... There's a couple of people there. I looked at Herbie because I, I didn't think he could putt much worse than what he did at Royal Queensland. And to your point, having that many bogeys and still finishing in the top 10, it was the same reason I was excited about why well, you're excited about Ken Davis having so few bogeys because if you can mm. have that many bogeys and still finish T7 in that tournament. So I really considered Herbie, but I just think there's a bit more control mm-hmm. in wild conditions in Mika's game at the moment than there is in Herbie's. Um, so I think, yeah, I look, it was, it's a red hot field. It'd be tough to narrow it down. Mm. But I do think, for me, um, I put a bit more credence into um, a guy that's played this tournament previously, played this course on these courses previously, who's got recent form in some pretty erratic weather conditions. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I, the more we've gotten to know Mika, um, there's, in my mind, there's two types of golfers as it relates to motivation. There's guys who are motivated by those that play around them Mm -hmm. and their competitive nature to beat another person. And there are those guys who are just internally motivated to get the best out of themselves. And the more I get to know Mika, I think he is the latter, not the former. And just listening to the way that he spoke about how disappointed he was coming out of rural Queensland, I just get the sense that it will be driven as fuck to get down there to Sydney and perform not necessarily to win, but just play the best golf that he knows he's capable of because he felt he was so far off that last weekend. So uh, there's a bit there, and I know it's it's typical 
um, KM as opposed to ND. It's typical feels. It's the vibe. It's Marbo. It's the mm. eye test. There's no data. There's no numbers. But hey, it's what I'm feeling, and I can't fight this feeling. That's okay. That's okay. And let me tell you, to be a very popular winner, uh, certainly amongst the two of us, but uh, amongst Australian golf uh, as well. If he was to get the chockies uh, come next Sunday, so yeah, going to be tough conditions all around. Marshy, I'm not sure it probably uh, – I, I was trying to work out where the scoring might kind of land. I, I don't know if you've got to lean there very quickly, but I, I, I'm probably going to reserve my judgment here. I know that's a bit of a coward's move, but I'm going to reserve my judgment just because I can't work out if it's going to make for ultra soft conditions that people, that players are going to be able to score low or whether it's uh, – or whether the wind and the rain is going to make things more difficult. Can't work it out, so – I'm going to reserve. Look, I don't think it'll be 20 under put it that way. Yeah. Uh, I think I think the scoring will go low maybe through the first day or two when it is soft. But I mean, 35 kilometer wins, that's going to take some names on Sunday. Maybe. So, maybe. Yeah, I'd be surprised if it's anywhere near as low as Royal Queensland, which I'll see. Druids, any thoughts on a quick tip for the women's open? I do have one. It's again, I found this really tough because of the field that has been assembled um yeah to to your point to your point that you that you raised before i mean you, you read down the names as you were, were kind of just rattling them rattling them all off and it, someone like a Karis davidson really jumps out to me as a, as a player who yep. is playing excellent golf um I don't know. It really difficult. You know what? I'll, I'll stick with Karis. Um, she she's playing good golf at the minute. Um, I'm sure she'd love to get down there and 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 have um, the biggest win of her career, no doubt. I mean, spent a lot of time obviously over in the US doing what she does, and um, she's been striking the ball beautifully. So I'll take Karis there. Who have you got? I'm going to go with a player who's had an outstanding debut season. Mm-hmm. In the LPGA Tour, who's coming home uh, to play in her home city, uh, fronted a bit of media earlier today down in Sydney and played outstanding in this corresponding tournament last year, uh, and that's Grace Kim. Yep. So she's coming off uh, a fourth-place finish. She only finished behind Hannah Green, uh, Joya Shin, and the champion Ashley Buhai. She was three strokes back off Buhai last year. And I think, um, yeah, off the back of that debut season, she's had an unreal year in the States. I think she's going to have uh, a real drive to come home and and perform. Um, you know, similar sort of motivation. I mean, we come home with a bit of a wet tail um, from performance overseas and, you know, put yourself on the map here in Australia. So, yeah, I reckon Grace is primed um, to go to go low this weekend um, and, and potentially be holding the trophy at the Australian Golf Club on Sunday afternoon, Dreads. Super popular winner again. So who be, else? Yes. Who else? Anything else that you've got before we let the good people go back briefly, to whatever they're doing? Um, Kip Poppet, I think, will be difficult to be. He's a defending champion in all abilities. But Brendan Lawler, the Irishman, I think, will be his main competition there. So great event. Look forward to uh, talking about that in the review as well. Um, Tiger is back on the golf course this week. The Hero World Challenge in the Bahamas, his own tournament, makes his return to competitive golf. So... There's that. I mean, if it wasn't in any other week, we'd probably have a bit more time to talk about uh, a seismic news event like Tiger's first golf in a long, long time. So I look yep. forward to keeping an eye briefly on that. And then very briefly, it would be remiss of me not to mention that my United took pretty comfortable care of your coffees, the 3-0 victory over Everton at Goodison Park, kicked off by one of the all-time great Premier League goals by Alejandro Garnacho. If you haven't mm. seen it, uh, go and Google it. One of the great bicycle kicks in Premier League history. Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Hasn't been the easiest of times for my Everton Doffies um, as we uh, deducted 12 points, but hey, it might be the good kick up the ass that we need to kind of start running the club in, in much better fashion. So let's uh, let's move on pretty swiftly from that. Uh, plenty plenty of other sport that we could talk about, KM. I mean, there's, there's so much. I'm, like, I'm going to squeeze this in, in in 10 seconds. Obviously, we kicked the Indians' ass in the in the golf, uh, in, sorry, in the cricket. That was cricket, outstanding yeah. of Travis, Travis and Head. And the golf for that matter too, we probably yeah, do. probably do. Travis Head was one of the great uh, great knocks, one of the uh, – probably in the top five catches I reckon I've ever seen. That was – I don't think people comprehend how difficult that catch was. 
Uh, I mean, of course, college football coming to the pointy end of the season. Your Texas Longhorns playing against the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Uh, if uh, if Texas win that, I reckon they might find themselves in the college football playoff. My Oregon Ducks take on the Washington Huskies. If they win that, they might find themselves in the college football playoffs. Might be an Oregon Texas game in the final Huge. of the college, uh, in one of the finals of the college football playoffs. Who actually knows? But that is uh, everything else that I've got for right now. Thanks for bringing up Everton. You've really ruined my Monday. My pleasure. Uh, don't forget if you're not in if you are in Sydney, make sure you get to either or both of the lakes in the Australian uh, on any of the four days or all of the four days if your schedule allows. Uh, I can recommend as Drew's again, having been to the tournaments this year, it, it's an excellent day out um, mm. and and a rare privilege to see players with quality in the flesh. If you can't broadcast Channel Nine, KO and Fox Sports, I believe it's eleven to four or eleven to five daylight time check your local guys but the broadcast team led by Ali Whitaker has been excellent Ports has been excellent on the ground but I've really enjoyed Ali Whitaker up in the box she's wonderful um, so check out the, the broadcast and keep an eye on the socials um, probably won't be as active because we're not there in the flesh in Sydney but we'll, we'll keep it over across the four days and who knows pending um, a few things going on in either ends of the country we might keep up the daily reviews and the videos as well yes. we'll do our level best if not we will be back in your ears hopefully talking about uh, either or Ken Davis and David Nichols.